Del timor lo cruzó de la patria, se levanta el clamor popular, ya se anuncia la nueva alborada, todo Chile comienza a cantar, recordando el soldado valiente, cuyo ejemplo se cierra en morir. Welcome back to the Red Pole Cafe, and uh, once again we've got uh, it's a wonderful welcome back, Pete Watson from Leeds University. If you remember last time Pete was here, the match was called off due to a frozen pitch, and Pete's back, and the match has been called because of the waterlogged pitch. Well done, Peter. <laughs> so it's a Jonah. I don't know what we're going to do, him. but yeah, it's great to welcome Pete back to talk about South American football. We've even got some videos this time, but guess what? They're not working. So in the tradition of the record captain, none of the none of the videos work. So, Pete. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, at least it's getting warmer. Yeah, last time there was ice. You know, kind of uh, rain this time. You know, kind of get a drought next time I'm around. So, do, do my best. Um, right. It's a privilege to be back here. Really enjoyed talking to you last year. Um, thanks very much to David and to Keith for the invitation back. Um, what I'm going to talk about this year is about Chile, so we're changing countries, and the reason I wanted to talk about this particularly is it's because it's the 50th anniversary of the Pinochet coup. Uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, the country there have been a lot of events commemorating what happened, um, particularly in the north. Um, I was at an event a couple of weeks ago actually where they were talking about the solidarity networks that, that happened for Chilean uh, exiles in Britain, and there were a lot of Chilean exiles who came to Bradford, to Rotherham, to Leeds, to Sheffield, and received a very important, a very welcoming, you know, kind of atmosphere. They were kind of part of trade unions, of strikes, of solidarity movements. So it feels very appropriate to be back in Bradford and talk about this kind of issue 50 years on. Um, so what we're going to try and do today is we're going to discuss, and hopefully you can see that, but I'll explain most things is. We're going to talk about two years in particular. We're going to talk about 1973 and 1974. We're going to start with talking a little bit about the political scenario, just so you've got an idea about what's really going on. We're then going to talk about Colo Colo and their Copa Libertadores run, and how this got used by um, Salvador Allende, who was the left-wing president at the time. Uh, we're then going to talk to you about the coup and how football and this, the national stadium became a concentration camp, and some of the stories that happened at that particular time how that involved quite a few of the footballers. And then there's a very famous World Cup qualifying uh, two games that Chile play against the Soviet Union where politics is very much at the forefront. So we're going to talk to you about those two games and then a little bit about the World Cup in 74 and how Pinochet kind of used football at that particular time. So that's what we're going to try and talk about. Um, so here's the background information for you. I'm going to zoom through this. So we have a, we have a, a socialist uh, in, in government, Salvador Allende. There's a picture of him here. Um, again, voted with him with Fidel Castro. Um, he has been voted in in 1970. Um, one of the key things to, to know about this is that there is not kind of like a majority vote that, that backs him up. And that's always part of the problem for the next three years before the coup actually happens. So we have this situation where he gets 36.2% of the vote. Uh, Jorge Alessandri, who is more kind of right wing, has got... 34.9, and a third candidate, Radomir Tomic, has got 27.9. Basically, according to the Chilean constitution, effectively whoever wins is almost ratified by um, the, the Senate afterwards. So it's kind of, he's kind of allowed in, if you like. But he never has a majority government. That's part of the problem for the next three years. Um, he actually was a member of Everton, uh, not the Liverpool one, but the, the Chilean version of it, but proclaimed to support La U, Universidad de Chile. So he's a bit of a David Cameron figure about not really knowing which team he supports and that kind of thing. So we've got a kind of prime, a president on dodgy sporting grounds, but anyway, that's just by the way. Um, again, pretty much immediately there is military opposition to Allende. Um, and again, one of the uh, people who was supporting him, a guy called General René Schneider, who is a constitutionalist, i.e. someone that said, no, he won the election, we have to let him in, he was murdered. But the counter effect of this was that the, 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 kind of, the, the, kind of the country rallied around and said, no, we have to make sure he stays in power, um, Allende has to become president. So the kind of military almost dissuaded from any particular action at that particular time. Um, what happens pretty much straight away though, and again it's almost quite uh, uh, appropriate that, we're, that Henry Kissinger died a couple of days ago, is that the CIA immediately start their operations to try and bring Allende down, okay? almost immediately. 
uh, because this, as we know, is kind of part of the Cold War period in South America. This kind of goes back to obviously Castro, the revolution in Cuba. You have American uh, actions throughout the continent to try and stop these type of left-wing movements from accessing power. Okay, it's happened before in Guatemala. It continues to happen in Colombia with stopping the kind of FARC. Um, it happens, you know, with uh, in Bolivia when um, Che Guevara goes to Bolivia to try and get a, a movement going there. The CIA are extremely active, and they're extremely active in Chile. And all of the kind of things that are kind of on this right side, which are problems that are happening in Chile, we do get inflation, we do get the problems in growth, we have issues to do with the copper industry. To a large extent, some of these issues are kind of uh, promoted or facilitated or made more of a problem by CIA interference who are, uh, who are kind of in a kind of coalition with the, the kind of right wing opposition forces in Chile trying to bring this down. Some of the things that uh, Allende does try to do in the three years he has in office are things like nationalising the mining industries. Again, a lot of the money of things like copper, the nitrates, was going out of Chile into foreign companies' pockets. So again, this is always a source of problem for the Chileans. Uh, we have land distribution problems. Again, the same kind of issues. The kind of uh, elites have largely um, taken away land from kind of poor farmers, particularly the indigenous and the Mapuche. Um, so there are, problem, there are programs to improve education, healthcare, workers' rights, all these kind of things. So it's quite a progressive government, but again, like we say, we always have this problem of it being a, a kind of minority government uh, and also a kind of concerted opposition where the centre are uniting with the right to try and bring him down. And again, we have the CIA behind this as well, which, which further complicates things. Um, again, they are creating links with places like Cuba, uh, which again furthers kind of uh, you know, USA concerns. Um, and again, the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that most of South America is quite conservative at the time. We have a tradition of military dictatorships, which are starting to put pressure on these kind of governments. So Allende is working on a very difficult playing ground, essentially. Um, okay, the coup, again, we're just going to talk about what, the, what happened with the coup. Again, March is a key time, and again, we'll come back to this. We have parliamentary election in March of 1973. Um, there is a concerted effort to, uh, of the right and the centre to remove Allende from government, but they fail. They, they run short. Um, I think they get something like 53% 50, of the vote is the opposition. Allende gets more or less 43. So again, the, the parliament is not in Allende's favour, but they don't have the majority they need to get him out of office. But this kind of tide of opposition is growing. Okay? Collar Collar were playing in March. Okay, we'll come back to that in a little bit of time. We have a lot of protests, there is a lot of social discontent. If anyone's interested in this, there is a documentary called um, La Batalla de Chile, uh, which is on YouTube, uh, The Battle of Chile. It's kind of got subtitles. It tells you all about what's going on, uh, you know, kind of with kind of a documentary style camera in the streets all around this period. So thoroughly recommend that if, you, if you're interested. Uh, it's on the 29th of June, uh, there is what's called the Tanque Tasso, the kind of the tank attack, if you like, led by uh, Colonel Roberto Super. This is seen as being almost like a trial run for the coup, but again it is put down. Um, there is another constitutional crisis in August, which leads to um, Allende appointing Pinochet uh, to become his kind of commander-in-chief of the army, believing that Pinochet was someone that was supporting him. So therefore it's ironic, almost just two weeks later on the 11th of September, when Pinochet leads the armed forces coup that will depose uh, Salvador Allende. We can see, I don't know if you can see it, there's a picture of Allende just kind of looking up at the sky. There's some very famous pictures of, of the, uh, the um, Chilean Air Force planes attacking the, the Moneda, the kind of the, the palace where, uh, the presidential palace. So, that, so there is a battle going on, there are kind of you know, missiles being sent into the palace. Allende will, will either commit suicide or be killed, depending on the story that you, you kind of believe, really. Um, so, again, there's some of the kind of shots of La Moneda. If you ever go to Santiago, you can still see bullet holes in the walls of that particular building. So, that's the history, okay? The coup went to the hands of the coup. Colo Colo, uh, the team that we're going to be talking about for the first half of this presentation, are the major team of, of Chile. Um, they are founded in 1925 as a breakaway club of another famous team called Magallanes. And they are based on this idea of modernity. A lot of the clubs that existed in Santiago at the time are really old kind of elite clubs where 
people from the main schools or potentially British elites or British exiles have created these football teams and they're kind of marginalising the, the, kind of the working classes. Working class clubs do exist, but there is this kind of idea that football is slightly the domain of the elite still, slightly behind the likes of Uruguayans and Argentina. Um, they based their idea on Colo Colo, who was a kind of an Araucanian Indian uh, indigenous leader who supposedly uh, fought very bravely against the, uh, the, Chile sorry, the Spanish um, colonizers. Um, so there's this idea of Chileanness. Okay, we pick a Chilean hero who goes beyond back before the British, back before the Spanish, and we and we kind of set our loyalty on this idea. But at this time, the Mapuches are very much marginalised. The indigenous community, the Mapuches, are not really part of the nation. They're still seen as backward, you know, uncivilised savages, and there is no real respect for them. So we have this kind of weird idea of celebrating this indigenous figure, but that not having any idea of reality really. Um, again, they have this pioneering tour uh, of Europe in 1927. David Arellano, who is the first star of Chilean football, dies on that tour in a match in Valladolid, becomes kind of martyred, becomes very famous, and almost leads this idea of everyone supporting this club. Okay, it's a club that's succeeding, it's going to Europe, uh, they're having success, there's an idea of martyrdom, they're not kind of uh, English in any way, they're not Spanish, and again we have different kind of commu um, colony clubs in Chile, like Unión Española, the Spanish kind of uh, expats. We have Aldax Italiano, which was an Italian expats club. So this is seen as a Chilean club that the working class uh, can get behind. So Colo Colo become, in lots of ways, the national team. To the extent that when it's the anniversary of the War of the Pacific between Peru and Chile, uh, Colo Colo play various matches against Peruvian teams as a way of improving this idea of diplomacy. Okay, so Colo Colo become configured as the Chilean team, which is why in this particular Copa Libertadores run, they become very representative of this country striving for football success, and everyone rallies behind them. So, the campaign itself. Um, the background is, is that the Copa Libertadores started in 1960, and no Chilean club had actually ever got to the final. Okay, so it's 13 years of no success. Um, and when Colo Colo start having this great run, they're in the original group with the other Chilean team, Unión Española. They're with two Ecuadorian clubs, Emelec and El Nacional, so it's quite an easy group, to be fair. Uh, and they score five in all of their three home games, which is a, a great thing. I'm, I was going to show you one of the games which every single goal is an absolute banger. Um, we might just kind of have a, have a YouTube break right directly to that website in a minute. Um, but again, the important thing here is that all the matches are in March for this particular tournament, which is when the parliamentary elections are going on. So while the country is kind of in turmoil, there are protests, there are kind of, there is kind of a, this worry that there might be some, there is always violence on the streets, there are protests from the, 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 the Unidad Popular, Allende's party, you have protests on the right as well, you have street clashes. But what happens when the football matches are on is it all stops. Okay, the kind of violence stops, and a lot of the footballers, when they're interviewed about this, said this was when everyone forgot who they supported, they forgot their politics, and they watched Colo Colo. You have Colo Colo matches on TVs and kind of shop windows and various other buildings in Santiago where people can gather around and watch them, because again, you know, not many people had TVs in Santiago at the time. So it becomes almost like this kind of, this event that stops the protest, stops the politics, stops the violence, and displaces this attention. It's almost like the whole bread and circuses idea. You know, the idea of football suddenly stops what the country is worried about. Um, then they go on to play the semi-finals. Um, they are in a tough group with Cerro Porteño and Botafogo. The Botafogo team have seven members of the 1970 World Cup winning team. Okay, so a decent side. They play in the Maracana. Okay, so, uh, obviously Colo Colo have to go and play in the Maracana and they win 2-1. Okay, and I'll show you some pips in a little bit of the newspaper reports, but this is seen as being the greatest Chilean football triumph of all time. Okay, go to the Maracanã, there's 120,000 people there, they win 2-1. A perfectly valid goal is ruled out by a probably biased ref. Okay, and again, we'll, we'll come back to this as well. I was going to show you videos of the decisions so we could have a, a chatter about whether they're good decisions or not, but again, that's gone wrong. Um, but this is a really big deal. So as soon as they beat Botafogo, the magazine that is sold... Uh, the next day, Estadio sells out. It's the greatest selling uh, magazine of all time in Chile up to that point. So we get this idea of a real national moment. 
Um, they eventually beat Serra uh, Porteño, they draw 3-3 three, three Botafogo at home, and then they get to the final against Independiente of Argentina. This, is gonna be, this was going to be the first video. Um, as you can see, a great bit of action. Um, this is one of the kind of solo goals, but this is against Unión Española. If you get the chance, uh, just look up Colo Colo versus Unión Española, 1973. Um, you'll see two long-range free kicks, a diving header, two, this is a kind of a dribbled run from the halfway line. Every goal is a brilliant goal. And you get this idea of a team that can play. Okay? The main figure that you can see kind of in the white is Carlos Casali, who is the kind of poster child of, of Chilean football at this particular time. A very skillful player. He's known as the king of the square meter because he's got this ability to dribble past people in very, very narrow areas. And again, one of the other videos was going to show a little bit of that as well. Um, but anyway, that will remain for another day. And what I might do is, is chuck him on my Twitter page so people can have a look at it if people like. Um, this was the other really famous goal. Um, Again, Carlos Casley again, dribbles from the halfway line. This, I don't think it's that good. There's two very half-hearted challenges, uh, including with the goalkeeper. But it's the great thing about running the ball right into the net. What did become really nice, though, is this kind of pitch. It became very emblematic of the whole country starting to rally behind him. What you can see is he kind of kicks the ball in the net. Someone clatters into him. And he's kind of left kind of lying in the, in the net with the goal. And some photographer takes the takes the picture of that particular moment. So that is one of those emblematic uh, pictures and memories of football. What did become really nice though is this kind of picture became very emblematic of the whole country starting to rally behind him. What you can see is he kind of kicks the ball in the net, someone clatters into him, and he's kind of left kind of lying in the, in the net with the goal and some photographer takes the takes the picture of that particular moment. So that is one of those emblematic uh, pictures and memories of football that people go back and say, oh yeah, do you remember Cassidy? Do you remember that goal? Do you remember the dribble? Uh, get, sorry. Um, these are kind of these memories that people go back to that matter and kind of unite people around why football was important at different times, okay? Particularly when, and we'll talk a, bit about, a little bit more about this later on, Carlos Cassidy is very left wing. He is uh, he's a former member of the, the kind of the, the communist youth at his university. He was still at university at this particular time. So he is seen as being someone that's quite emblematic of this new Chile under Allende as well. Um, oops, I have to remember not to click that one. Okay. So the finals. Um, what happened in the Libertadores at the time is that you, there was no away goals. Okay, it just went to playoff if you had to. Um, the first game in Avellaneda, at home in Buenos Aires, is a 1-1 draw. There is an own goal to start with by, the, um, by Sa, the, the Independiente centre-back. Uh, uh, then they will equalise with a very, very controversial goal. Again, I was going to show you that. Again, you can have a look at that. I'll put up the links later on. Um, they draw the home leg 0-0. Uh, Again, there are some very controversial decisions against Colo Colo in that game as well. And then eventually they will lose the, the, um, the kind of the repertoire of the final decider 2-1 away in Montevideo. Again, there are some poor decisions in that one. Um, what's quite interesting is, is these newspapers. So I'm just going to kind of show you what kind of things they're saying. So this one is basically the cacique, because the cacique is like an Indian chief, the color Colo idea. They, they, they kind of fell, but they were standing up bravely. Okay, this one. They stole the cup from us. And again, the idea of NOS for a national newspaper, they stole it from us. So it's not just from Colo Colo, this is for the country. Okay, this is seen as being at the Argentine, Uruguay, and Brazil football mafia that they kind of think exists. Stealing the cup from the kind of the, the smaller countries. Um, they ended up with 10 men. Um, Lionel Herrera was sent off um, for pulling someone's moustache. <laughs> Not a great move. Um, this one, um, with ten men and the referee against, we lost. Um, like a champion, the Colo Colo fell. Um, but then what you also see here that's interesting is the kind of social problems that are going on on the front page. So, uh, the mining and work ministers are suspended. Okay? So things like that. Uh, we have these kind of problems that are just kind of on the side of things. Some of the nice little stories about this final is that um, Leonel Herrera 
uh, when they went to um, play the final, the final game, they were staying in the same uh, hotel as the referee. And Lionel Herrera said we should bribe him because we know that the Argentines will be doing exactly the same. It happened to us already twice, so let's bribe the ref. And the Colo Colo, uh, man, uh, the Colo Colo kind of, um, director, the owner, who was called Don Aladino, uh, Don Aladdin, because he owned a lamp factory, so great nickname. Uh, he said, no, we're going to win it fair and square. But this kind of shows you the fact that Leonel Herrera, kind of 20 years later, saying we wanted to bribe the ref. We were talking about bribing the ref. Um, just kind of shows you that kind of idea of what the Libertadores was at this particular time. Um, so, this is the, the first dodgy goal. It's one of those, basically, where there's a, there's a kind of a missed clearance. It's a little bit like the, um, the 1986 Maradona goal, where the defender kind of, you know, tries to, it's kind of slices back towards the goalkeeper. The independiente forward, you can't quite see it, will come clattering into the goalkeeper and basically get man and ball pushed into the goal. One of the other great bits of this video that's worth watching, if you get the chance, is that one of the Colo Colo defenders, just after it, absolutely twats him up into the air straight after, it just takes a swing and boots him, goes flying. All the other Colo Colo players go off to kind of protest against the ref. So that's worth watching just for that kind of bit of petulance. Um, the other, the other goal, I was going to show you this one as well, this is the other disputed goal in the home game. Uh, we can't quite see it, but he's crossed it. Um, there's a little flick there, and Cassily, who was onside at the time, you can see it on the clip, will end up putting the ball in it. Okay, so that's the, they're the two decisions that all the Colo Colo fans still remember, but all the country still remembers as well. Okay, it's, they've robbed it from us because this is a Chilean event. Um, it's worth saying actually as well, um, ten, uh, 10 years after that particular game, we've got a Brazilian referee, and he will say that he was, he was uh, suggested not to let the Chileans win. He actually goes on TV and says this. So again, all the Chilean players will, will come back and say, it was a fix, we never had a chance. Um, there is a lovely bit of play as well on this video of Carlos Cassidy beating about four people in a really narrow area, it's nearly scoring, the, defense, the goalkeeper just gets a slight hand and it hits the post. So, again, if you want a little bit of a feel of how close they came, uh, that's worth watching. Uh, right, so, these are the major players, and again, um, we can see this is a Panini album from 1974, it doesn't look like the, the real photos, it looks like a few heads have been stuck on kind of red shirts. Um, so, Luis Alamos is the coach of Colo Colo, but also is the coach of the national team. He has certainly got left-wing tendencies, although not avert. Carlos Castley, as we already said, is very left-wing, okay? Very much part of the Juventudes Comunistas, becomes a poster child of the Ende government. Leonardo Vélez is also the same kind of idea. Will again play for Chile in the 1974 World Cup. He admitted after the game that he, he would used to take kind of protest songs after the coup in uh, like kind of tapes in his, or records in his bag. He used to take Victor Jara, who will eventually die in, after the golpe de estado. Um, so he was someone that again was on this kind of side of the, of the uh, political sphere. Um, Chamaco Valdez, again, one of the great Chilean attacking midfielders of all time. Uh, again, one of the leading stories for Colo Colo and for Chile as well. And again, we have these kind of other forwards who will, who will become you know, leading figures and again, leading memories. Um, what is interesting that is worth saying though, is that even though we have these quite left-wing figures, and again, we'll talk about how Allende appears with this, Apparently, according to all of them, politics was never really spoken about in the changing room. This was something that just wasn't part of this run. Okay, but what they did feel is that they were playing for the country. Okay, they all had that very clear. They weren't just playing for Colo Colo fans. They felt they were very much playing for the pride of Chile and trying to beat this kind of Uruguayan, Brazilian, Argentinian monopoly over football in the Libertadores at the time. So, Salvador Allende. Again, Football being appropriated by politicians for their own benefit is as old as time itself. Okay, you know, we talked about it a little bit last time I was here. Same thing kind of happens. Again, here we have uh, Allende inviting the Colo Colo team on several different occasions to La Moneda, to the presidential palace, before the major games for these photo opportunities. 
Okay, he's the one just here in this particular photo. Again, in the middle, in the second photo here. Again, here he is with Carlos Casley, the kind of the star figure of that particular team. And again, we've got these kind of statements in newspapers. Allende reiterates confidence of the country, of the people, okay, but the country is talked about, but Pueblo is obviously the word they use, for the color of 1973. He recognizes the double militancy, i.e. the double significance of football. He is associating Colo Colo with the needs of the people, with the pride of the people, of being representative of the people, almost extolling the more working class side of the Colo Colo fan identity. But the problem is obviously they were supported by all elements of society as well. So, but this is kind of what Allende is doing. Apparently he would ring up the coach before all the games um, and say, wish, you know, wish luck, we're all with you. But apparently also we would say, you're the only thing that's stopping um, this country falling apart. You're the thing that's uniting us. Like you're the thing that's stopping uh, the violence. Okay, so keep going. So that political message is very present. Okay, and he reiterates it on several occasions, in these kind of occasions as well. Um, apparently he goes to Buenos Aires to watch the first final as well against Independiente or Avellaneda. So he is very aware of the, the um, the, you know, the power that football has, and has tried to use it to the maximum, being visible in the press, being visible when he's speaking about each of those games, making sure the country is knowing that he is behind the football team. Okay, and again, you have to do that if you're a South American president. If you don't like football, if you can't talk about the nation at these times, you're missing a big opportunity. But, so Allende is very conscious of that, despite being a, an Everton or a Laul fan, fan, so anyway. Um, a few more images, just to show you the impact of what's going on. So we have the first one. They murder or assassinate the chief of the Patria Libertad uh, newspaper. Okay, but, grande el colo. El colo colo is great. Okay, they were the true cyclone, they won 4-0. So we have this kind of juxtaposition of the trials and tribulations of society where political murders and political protests are going on, political strikes, you know, all these kind of issues. But football is displacing them on the front page. Kind of same thing here. Uh, Chile shakes the Maracana, not Colo Colo. Chile. Okay? Here we have it again. We are all singing from Arica, which is the, the town or the city right in the far north of Chile. You know, Chile, the country most likely to, to collapse if it bends in two. Okay? Arica is the kind of far desert north. Magallanes is basically Patagonia. So we were all, all singing from Arica to Magallanes, this idea of the whole country behind Colo Colo. Uh, and again, this is where it says, this is the greatest triumph of Chilean football. This is the, the victory against uh, Botafogo. And again, there are books about this, okay? There is a lot of dispute about whether Colo Colo are stopping the coup from taking place. All of the games that we're talking about, are take, well, the first games we're talking about are taking place when the, 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 uh, the elections are going on. And Colo Colo is displacing that violence. Some of the books can say this is a fanciful idea, it was still going to happen, maybe it delayed it a little bit, but what is certainly true is that whenever they did play, the country stops. You know, everyone talks about the country becomes paralysed, radios being put on. If people can watch TVs and kind of shop windows, they're doing it. The guards around the presidential palace occasionally play the Colo Colo anthem, okay, as well, when on match day. So the, it's becoming a national event that is almost stopping the, the general problems that Chile is facing at this particular time. Okay, onwards. So, this is now onto the coup. Okay, so now we're going onto the coup itself. Um, th this is one of the most grisly kind of periods in Chilean history. Okay, we have tens of thousands of people uh, murdered. Uh, we have, again, m many, many more than that uh, become exiled. A lot of them, when we talked about, came to Bradford, Leeds, Rotherham, Sheffield. Chilean exiles go to about 126 countries around the world. Okay? One of the worst things that happened is that the National Stadium becomes a concentration camp. Okay? The Estadio Nacional, which is exactly where Colo Colo have been playing all of their home games in the Copa Libertadores. So the place that had been the place where the national team are playing, where Colo Colo is playing, now becomes a place where people are being tortured, are people being murdered and are being detained just because they are left wing just because they might be members of the Socialist Party, just because they might have voted for the Union Popular, um, you know, or they might be seen as students who might have attended a protest, sorry. 
Um, so there is this kind of rounding up of people, and about 20,000 people are held uh, in the Estadio Nacional uh, between September the 11th, when the coup happens, through to mid-November. Okay, that's the numbers we're talking about. Lots of little stories, okay, that happen. The, the, st the football stadium and its facilities become used for, uh, as a torture kind of process, a processing part for torture. Okay, the tannoy, the tannoy system is used to call out particular people to go to certain places where they would be questioned, interrogated, tortured. Okay, some didn't come back. Um, the detainees are held in the changing rooms. Okay, so you have these packed changing rooms underneath the ground. They're held in different parts of the stadium underneath the pitch. Uh, again, waiting for their turn to be questioned by, by the army and the military forces. Um, during the day, as you can see here, they, they're held in the stands. Okay, so they're almost becoming fans and waiting, you know, on the, on the stands, waiting for their turn. Okay, so it's a really terrible thing. You know, we have certain, there are certain press that do go and show these kind of things. Um, here's one of these pictures from El Mercurio, which is the main Chilean newspaper. 4,000 are detained in the National Stadium, a visit of Chilean and foreign journalists. And at this time, you can see some of the French journalists who are shouting questions to the people in the stand saying, are you communists? No, we're not, we're, we're students, we're workers. Okay, what some of them are saying. And then they start saying, can you give us a cigarette? And they start throwing, the journalists are throwing cigarettes, it's like monkeys in a cage. Okay, they're kind of throwing these cigarettes and there's kind of like people scrabbling around to get the cigarettes so they can have a smoke. Okay, so they're kind of being, being kind of displayed as being the communist, the Marxist threat, the terrorist threat. Okay, to the foreign press, to Chilean press as well. There is an incredibly powerful documentary called Estadio Nacional by Carmen Luz Parot. Um, unfortunately, it is on YouTube, it doesn't have any English subtitles. But some of the stories, I'm just going to pick a couple of stories that I wanted to, to take back, because I think they're really powerful. The first one is of the hooded man. And this is a kind of representation of it in the documentary. That's not what he really looked like. But what would happen was, someone would come around the stadium with a bag on his head, and would, would kind of point to people. Okay, and he'd be kind of being, he'd be lit, he'd be followed by the, the military figures. He'd point to certain people and, they, and they'd be taken away. It turned out later that he was a guy called Juan Munoz, who had been a member of the Socialist Party but had left due to various disagreements before the coup. And he'd been kind of appropriated by the military to, to point out people that they, that, you know, they thought they should question. So he kind of turned traitor on them. Several years later, he would admit to this. And then a couple of weeks after that, he's found murdered in a kind of ditch. Okay, so, but he becomes a, st a story that everyone remembers. He had the hooded man of the Estadio Nacional. The other one I really like, which is almost like this triumph of humanity in the football fans, is that, you know, when they're, they're mo the, the kind of stadium is getting, is getting ready for the games against the Soviet Union, which we'll come on to in a sec. And the lawnmower is kind of going up and down the pitch, just doing the, you know, mowing the lawn, mowing the pitch. And whenever the, whenever the lawnmower gets close to the goal, you can imagine all the, all the guys in the stadium going, oh, you know, and then cheering when he gets to the goal itself. And again, that kind of like felt like a really lovely you know, moment of humanity and of solidarity in the kind of stands, you know, bearing in mind what they faced. Um, again, I don't know if you can quite see this, but uh, what was very moving is in this documentary, they invite people back who were there. And they take you to the places where they were. They take you to the changing rooms, the, the kind of the bits around the, the kind of stands, and they show you where they carved their name. Okay, so here's the initials, RJJ, 12th of the 11th, uh, 73. And they talk about these kind of ways of trying to, you know, you know be remembered. And memory is a really key aspect of, of what happened. This documentary is all about memory. It's about telling the stories of, of kind of what happened. There is a very funny story about a priest as well who turns up, he's kind of got his microphone trying to talk to the, the people in the stands, get them to repent from their demonic socialism, and, and he's generally laughed out of it by, by, the, um, by the people there. Um, again, you know, I wish it had English subtitles. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do is, is get in contact with the, 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 the director and see if they can find a way to do it. It's a really amazing, powerful document that needs to be seen as a historical document of what happened, okay, in a football stadium. Um, it's still a site of memory, okay, kind of 50 years on. We have this kind of key sign in, in the kind of Escotilla, I guess the entrance point eight, okay, uh, which is still there. It says, a people without memory is a people without future. 
So this stadium is not just uh, a football stadium, it is a place of memory. It was dedicated as a site that needed to be protected by the Chilean government, I think in 2003 or 2008. I can't remember if I wrote that down. Uh, yeah, 2003. It's described as a site of memory. Um, people weren't allowed to sit there. Okay, that was kind of, you know, kept held sacred. Um, whenever Leonardo Vélez, okay, we talked about him, he was one of the players that uh, was kind of left wing. Whenever he said he always saw ghosts. Whenever he played in the Estadio Nacional for the national team, he always saw ghosts there. And Carlos Casali said that whenever he played there, he, he kind of felt this obligation to entertain the ghosts of the people who didn't make it out. So there is this kind of key memory importance of the terrible things that were perpetuated in this particular stadium. Um, and again, kind of very powerful kind of photos, I think. Even some of the players uh, since, these are two players from Universidad de Chile, who um, a couple of years ago on this particular photo came and put flowers, wreaths, as a kind of symbolic gesture of all of our footballers remember this. Okay, so again, this is something that, that happens on a fairly regular basis, year on year on year. Okay. Um, how did it affect the footballers themselves? The most famous story is that of Hugo Lepe. Um, Hugo Lepe was a defender in the 1962 World Cup, which Chile hosted, some of you might remember. Um, and he, after this, became the, one of the presidents of the Footballers' Trade Union. So he was a left winger, uh, kind of, throughout his career, had represented Chile at the very highest level, um, and actually worked for Allende in the Ministry of Public Works. So he was one of the people that was targeted after the coup, and was taken to the Estadio Nacional. Chamaco Valdez, again, I brought him up earlier, one of Colo Colo's great players, one of Chile's greatest players, will go and seek his release. When he gets back from the first leg of the qualifying game against the, against the, Russia, against the Soviets, finds out that Hugo Lepe is there because he's part of the trade union, and will go to the stadium and say, we want to find Hugo Lepe. Apparently, he even rings Pinochet and has a 15-minute conversation with Pinochet saying, we need to release this man. Okay, and eventually he is released. Okay, so he's the most famous figure. But several other players are affected. Um, Leonardo Vélez, his uncle, is detained. Uh, Leonardo Vélez, after he gets back from Moscow, will go to the Estadio Nacional wearing his collar collar shirt and will speak to the guards. And the guards recognise him. He says, my uncle's in here, I want him out. Okay, I play for Colo Colo, I play for Chile. Okay, and a couple of days later the uncle is released, apparently untortured. Okay. Also, the doctor of the national team apparently was tortured and was detained. Um, the father of N Nelson Vasquez, who is one of the kind of non-playing subs, I think he only plays two or three times for Chile, but again, his, his father was detained. A little bit after this, Carlos Casley's mother is also detained and tortured. Not at the Estadio Nacional, but a different center. None of the footballers themselves, Casley, Vélez, Luis Alamos, none of them are touched. Okay, by Pinochet, he's smart enough to realise that these are kind of figures of public attention that people might not accept, but family members are not exempt from this. So it touches football as well. So, the, uh, the World Cup qualifying. So, this is very significant because it is happening at exactly the same time as the coup is going on. Um, Chile have won their group, the USSR have won their group, uh, but they have to have this repertoire game to see who qualifies for Germany, Germany 1974. As you can imagine, this becomes loaded with political symbolism. Okay, we have Chile now represented by the by the army, who are stridently anti-left-wing, anti-communist, anti-Marxist, playing it playing against the global figures of Marxism, communism, and left-wingism. So it becomes almost like a kind of tiny microcosm of the Cold War struggle. Ch uh, Kola Kola have to play the first game in Moscow. Um, they fly out on the first flight after the coup. No planes have left the country at all. Um, so the first flight is that one on the 18th of September, a week after the coup. Color color out there. They don't know if they're going to be allowed to go. Um, there are worries about whether the likes of Cassidy will will um, you know will escape because again there are, you know there are some worries about whether he might be um, detained. Um, what does happen is that when they get to Moscow, two of the players, uh, Elias Figueroa, one of the great centre backs and Castley are both kind of detained at the airport. Castley, because he's shaved off his moustache, and it doesn't have the same photo as his passport, so that wasn't, but there's a kind of the traditional kind of Russian tricks, if you like. Um, the other problem is that the USSR are very, very aware of what's going on in Chile. 
Okay, so they break off diplomatic relations. So there is this incredible tension. Um, there is no coverage at all of the game. None at all. There is only uh, the photos taken by the El Mercurio photographer. Um, Moscow, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the Soviet government has demanded that the Russians have to win 3-0 because they have no intent of going to Santiago to play in the second leg. And they know that if they don't play that game, the punishment will only be a 2-0 loss. So they will qualify for the World Cup. So that's their plan. Um, somehow, Chile hold out. Elias Figueroa, Alberto Quintana, the two centre-backs, play an absolutely brilliant game. Oleg Blokin, who was the kind of great Russian, uh, great Soviet player of that generation, talks about the fact they just couldn't score. But they were very nervous because this political pressure was upon them. And again, there was no TV coverage, there's no radio coverage in the Soviet Union of this whatsoever, because they don't want to accept that they're kind of playing a game against uh, a kind of a, an enemy nation now. And if there is the slight chance of Chile winning, then obviously it'll look back to the Soviet Union. Apparently, again, apparently there are lots of stories about this, the referee is Brazilian, and apparently the referee is an ardent anti-communist. Uh, so apparently, again, there are lots of apparently's in this, um, but the, the Elias Figueroa, who is playing in Brazil at the time, is the only person that, on either side who can speak Portuguese, apparently talks to him and says, look, the Europeans always stuff us. You know, you're, you, know you don't want us to, you don't, you don't want us to lose this. Apparently, again, the, uh, the, the Colo Colo director gives a big box of nice cigarettes to the referee. Uh, and apparently, again, the Mercurio uh, journalist, who again, Mercurio is a very centre-right uh, idea, also speaks to the referee about these same kind of issues. Okay, so it looks like the Copa Libertadores, they weren't prepared to whack, but, but for Chile they were. So, you know, the patriotic good and all this kind of thing. Um, so it's nil-nil, okay? That's the first one. Again, we have this few headlines um, uh, of what's going on. Again, this kind of crossover of politics and uh, society. Six extremists die who were trying to escape. So this is the kind of language that's been used about the kind of people being detained in, in the Estadio Nacional, other concentration camps. That's the language that's been used. Meanwhile, and this was a friendly before, uh, the national team wins in, Sw in Switzerland. So again, we get this idea of the kind of language that's been used, and therefore you can imagine when they play the Soviet Union, the language is obviously very anti-Marxist. This is a win for Chile, this is a win for our government, this is a win against Marxism and communism. Okay? Here are some examples of this. So we have a triumphal draw for Chile. Okay? Um, if anyone's heard me talk before about Colombia, there's very similar rhetoric to when Colombia played the Soviet Union in 1962 and draw 4-4. Exactly the same. Okay? This is also key. Not even in football could the Soviets deal with Chile. Okay? So again, it is highly politicised. They can't deal with us in football, they can't deal with us in politics. This is superior. Okay? Sensational draw in Moscow. Okay? Figueroa and Quintana, two colossuses in defence. So again, the language is highly, highly politicised. Uh, and again, Pinochet, who has very quickly controlled the press, is very much behind this type of news reporting. There's a book about this, of just that game. Okay? The Match of the Brave by Axel Pickett. Okay? So again, this shows you how important it was. Um, the next game is going to be due to be held in Santiago uh, in November. The USSR demand a change of venue, they want to play in Germany. Um, the Polish and the um, East Germans also kind of support this, this move. Um, but the Chilean newspapers seize this and say they won't even come and play, what cowards they are. How dare they demand with their power that they, they are little Chile, you know. There's all this kind of power politics that's going on. It becomes a national cause, okay. Elias Figueroa, who is a Pinochet supporter, Okay, and therefore, for many people, that kind of tarnishes his reputation as probably one of the greatest defenders that South America has ever produced, is also outspoken about refusing to play elsewhere. Okay, he hasn't really come out in support of the new regime at the time, um, but he will, not, he will not play. So this is a whole patriotic, anti-Soviet, anti-Marxist, sort of effectively supporting the, the armed forces type of rhetoric that's going on. The Soviets will, will kind of produce a statement refusing to play. Um, again, I'll read it for you just in case you can't see. Due to moral considerations, the Soviet sportsmen cannot in this moment play in the stadium in Santiago, spatters out, spattered as it is by the blood of our Chilean comrades. The Soviet Union is making a resolute protest and declares that in the current conditions, 
when FIFA is working against the claims of common sense and are allowing Chilean reactionaries to lead them astray, that we have to refuse to participate in the elimination match on Chilean soil and we hold the FIFA administration responsible for our decision. Okay, so the Soviets are not going to go. Um, what is even worse? And this is probably, in my mind, the worst thing that FIFA have ever done. Okay, I mean, that's... There's quite a list. There's quite a list. Bold claim. But this is right up there. They send two inspectors to the Estadio Nacional. There's a Brazilian, Abilio de Almeida, who is... Uh, and Brazil at this time has a military dictatorship government. Okay, he is part of that, effectively. They also send a Swiss, a gay feminist neutral, Helmut Kaiser. They will go to the stadium for 15 minutes. Okay, here, is the, here they are. This is them doing their inspection. They're wandering around the pitch. At this time, there are probably 7,000 detainees underneath the stadium, hidden in the changing rooms, hidden in the corridors, where the men are never, the inspectors are never taken, okay, who are being held at gunpoint, and they are basically being told, you will not say anything. There are 7,000 people there, okay, who are, who are people who are being tortured, probably, okay. Somehow, the two inspectors don't see any of them in the 15 minutes that they're there. Okay, that's how long they spend with this inspection, wandering around the pitch, you know, checking the lines on the pitch, that kind of thing. A um, couple of things. Um, yeah, in these moments there were 7,000 people there. That commission wandered around the pitch, they, they joked, they laughed, they kind of looked at the prisoners and ignored them, apparently, uh, and then they went and left the statement, in the national stadium you can play, it's fine. The other quotes are, this is from El Mercurio, the centre-right newspaper again. FIFA informs the world that life in Chile is normal. Okay, that's the message. Okay, uh, so again, not a great statement. Um, what's also apparently true, according to an, art, an academic article I wrote, is that Dalmeida said to the, uh, the military kind of uh, figures, he said, don't worry about this, we're used to this, in a few weeks, the international press will move on and will forget about this. So just hold tight, the press will go away, and life will continue as normal. That was the message from one of the people doing this inspection, apparently, according to an academic article. So that's what we've got. The match is played, okay, such as it is. The ghost match, the match of shame, it lasts for 30 seconds. There is no uh, Russian, there's no separate team on the pitch. Um, Chamaco Valdez scores a great goal. Okay. It's like that Scot is that Scotland, Scotland against Estonia. Yeah. Similar thing, yeah. So it's like that. Seven passes, lovely passing move. I mean, it's, it's you know, tic tac football. Uh, Chamaco Valdez sticks in the net. Um, youth and sport unite Chile, is the message on the stand. There are 15,000 people there to watch that. But afterwards, they play Santos. Pele is not there, he's injured. Santos stuffed them 5 0. Okay, so a match is played in the Estadio Nacional that day. Uh, the, the kind of the detainees have now, have now gone. Um, again, there is, a, there is a kind of nice graphic novel about this called Silence in the Stadium. Okay, the match of shame. Um, this is that, there's a clip of the goal, so you can appreciate it. Uh, this is like halfway through the move, but again, that'll wait. For, I'll, I'll go on my Twitter feed later on. Um, okay. Uh, this is on to the World Cup. So Chile qualified for the World Cup effectively by default. Pinochet, like any good South American dictator or leader, knows that he has to talk about it. And again, we see this message, and it's almost identical to the way that the Argentine junta are talking about football in the 1970 World Cup. Almost identical. So, Chile also knows the problems that you will face in Europe because the calumny and lies have managed to change the mentality of many Europeans. If you look at Videla's speeches at the same time, it's exactly the same. European subversives, European terrorists are telling lies about us. Okay? Exactly the same rhetoric. Um, we are sure you will have some problems, but we are sure that as good Chileans, you will know how to deal with it and move forwards. We wish you good luck and success. In this video, Pinochet meets Carlos Casali, who refuses to shake his hand before the World Cup. That's quite a ballsy move. Quite a ballsy move. Won't shake his hand. Um, that is picked up. And this kind of anti Cassily narrative starts in the press. Can we trust this player to represent us? 
why, you know, he's a communist, why are we allowing him to play? That starts to appear. <coughs> Cassidy doesn't do himself any favours by being sent off against West Germany. Again, if you have a look at, I haven't got any of the newspaper headlines here on this slide, but again, you can have a look at it. It's, it's stupid. There is a foul, there's a kind of a foul on him. He basically boots, I um, can't remember who it is. It's, uh, I did write it down. He boot, I can't remember which, which player it is, but he boots something up in the air. Completely right red card. It's the first ever red card in the World Cup. Because there were people sent off, but they didn't have red cards before. Okay, so Carlos Castley. And of course, you can imagine how that's thought by in Chile, by the military government. He is, he has betrayed our nation. He's let our nation down. We shouldn't have trusted him. Why did we let him play? And his name goes mud. He is banned from playing for the national team, effectively vetoed for the next five years. Okay, he goes to play in Spain, but he, he hardly plays for Chile again. Okay, until the 1982 World Cup when he misses a penalty. Just an unfortunate. Great player, didn't do very well in the World Cups. Um, what is also significant about this World Cup is that in the game against Australia on a very sodden pitch, the Chilean exiles who've got, who are in Germany have this protest. They bring this kind of, uh, this, this kind of banner and flags onto the pitch. It does appear briefly on Chilean TV, but is not reported in any of the newspapers, obviously. Okay, so even though the world kind of sees it briefly, and again, there is more of a TV coverage than there has been, in Chile, it is kind of erased. Okay, so the exiles, the protests are erased. Um, Chile come back, they don't win any of the games. They, they draw that one, they draw against East Germany, but they go out. Okay, and Cassidy is blamed. Um, the last thing about Cassidy and Pinochet, okay, before we finish. Uh, this is the second time Cassidy and Pinochet uh, meet. What is significant here is that Cassidy is wearing a red, uh, red tie. Okay, ballsy bloke, okay. Um, Pinochet apparently does this kind of cutting kind of gesture, says, oh, we don't like that colour here. And apparently Cassidy says, it's okay, I've got loads of them back at home. <laughs> okay, so Carlos Cassidy should be your favourite Chilean player, possibly after Ivan Zamorano. Okay, very brave bloke. This is 1988. There is a plebiscite that is held by, um, by Pinochet to decide if he stays in power or not. The opposition managed to unite and they create this campaign to say no. There is a great film about it called No. Okay, I so re recommend you watch it. One of the most famous bits is we have Olga Garrido. You see the woman and she's talking about how she was tortured and what happened to her. At the very end of the video, it kind of cuts back and we see Carlos Casali, okay, who's talking about it. So the mother who suffered in one of the torture camps and Casali as this figure of opposition come out right before the final plebiscite to say, vote no. Okay, and it's, that is only, I think, a day or two before the actual vote. So Cassidy becomes incredibly significant at this key moment for Chilean future. And the plebiscite is won by the opposition, which eventually brings an end to the dictatorship that lasted for 15 years. That's kind of all I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's a kind of a, a, an overview of the time. Again, if anyone wants to hear more, I've done a couple of podcasts about this. Um, Happy to put various of the videos on online. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hope that was of interest. Thank you, Pete. That's, that's fabulous. Really, really fascinating stuff, but genuinely. Um, our next talk is the graveyard shift, otherwise known as 6th of January. When Dave Scala is going to bring a bit of Caribbean sunshine to our to our cold shores um, to talk about Bradford City's tour of um, the West Indies, the St Kitts, wasn't it, in 1999? So that was brilliant. And once again, thanks, thanks to Pete. And uh, if you follow him on Twitter, Pedro, uh, Pedro Professor, and he'll, he'll put some links up. So fantastic. Thank you. Soldados y obreros, la mujer de la patria también 
Estudiantes, empleados, mineros, cumpliremos con nuestro deber. Sembraremos la tierra de gloria, socialista será el porvenir. Todos juntos haremos la historia, a cumplir, a cumplir.